Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. It is a great honor to introduce you to the Recharged Women in Automotive, trailblazing the way for women to win in automotive. And our panel today is going to be moderated by none other than Eliana Reggio from Digital Airstrike and Women in Automotive. Eliana, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Ted. I'm so excited. I love the topic that we picked today. I love every single one of these presenters today. And I love how uh, Tedding's Fixed Ops Roundtable incorporates women in automotive into uh, all of their broadcasts and, mm. and really helps get the word out about this very important topic. Well, thank you. You've got an all-star panel. Uh, and before I let you introduce them, if I may just uh, some kudos to Ileana. At the last two events, uh, she has spoken at both of them, one on a women in automotive panel, Veronica, and then last event as a keynote speaker. And I've got to credit you because a number of segments at this event have been talking about the power of allyship. And I tell you, I had not even heard that word until maybe just a few months ago. So Eliana, thank you for all you do for our industry. Oh, gosh, that's such an honor. Thank you so much. Actually, we're going to hit on it in a little bit later today uh, in this very discussion. And before I let you go, Ted, and before we start this, thank you for your allyship, Mr. Oh. Ings. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I will step out of the way and let you get things going. Thank you so much, sir. All right. So as Ted said, welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for Fit. Uh, fixed Ops Roundtable Discussion with our illustrious Women in Automotive panel. And today we are going to be talking about trailblazing the way for women to win in automotive. We're going to be covering uh, practical ways dealers can advance the role of women in our industry. And if you've never thought of it before, don't worry. By the time you leave here today, you're going to have lots of practical advice. My name, as Ted told you, is Eliana Raggio. I'm going to be your moderator today. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to these four wonderful friends and colleagues that I've invited for today's discussion. Each one an active contributor to our mission at Women in Automotive and, you know, trailblazers in their own right. So first, let's say hello to Adam Ahrens. He's president, dealer, and CEO of Patriot Auto Group in New England, and he's also a member of the WIA Advisory Council. Joe Webb, oh my goodness, I've known Joe a long time. He's the president and founder of Dealer Knows Consulting and a member of the Women in Automotive Advisory Council. Audrey McKinley, she is president of Auto Network Consulting and also a member of the Women in Automotive Advisory Council. And not to be last, but Veronica Dunford, my girl. She is executive vice president of Dealer Built and executive board member of Women in Automotive. Thank you all so much, all of you, for being here with us today. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Um, first, I want all four of you to know that I asked you all to do this broadcast with me because all of you have incredible perspectives and insights into advancing the role of women in our industry. And I suspect that this topic is one that's near and dear to all of your hearts. And Veronica, I'm going to start off with you because, I mean, first of all, you and I have known each other more times, uh, more years than I want to admit. But we've known each other both <laughs> inside and outside of Women in Automotive. And um, it was one year ago, almost exactly, um, it was announced that you had taken over executive leadership of the Women in Automotive organization. So uh, I'm just going to start off with that. I mean, why did you feel an organization like Women in Automotive is important for our industry? And, and then if you could follow that up with, well, what are some of the things that you have planned to help women even more in 2023 and beyond? Well, thank you, Eliana. Actually, it's almost a year, not quite, but sneaking right up. Um, it was International Women's Day, ironically, and I didn't even know it was that day. Um, however, you know, it was just about a year ago that we were all sitting around at a conference um, for the previous ownership, pretty much all of us on this call, and uh, the previous owners had announced they wanted to retire. And several of us, including some that aren't here, uh, talked about wanting to continue the legacy and continue the drive and the mission. And, you know, I approached them and realistically begged and pleaded and said, hey, I really want this. And it took a while, um, but we prevailed and here we are. So, um, you know, being a woman myself in this industry, we, and being here going on 15 years, 
it's hard. I mean, it really is. Um, I'm sure everyone can can attest to that. It takes a lot, and I I approach it with um, humor a lot of times because I think that helps break the ice. But it really does take a lot to convince some of the men in this industry that they can be there for us in front of others. They can help us publicly without having to give up their man card. Perfect opportunity for me to segue over to Audrey McKinley. Um, Audrey, you not only are one of the Women in Automotive board members uh, spearheading the mentorship program, but you yourself, you have mentored and continue to mentor many people to greater success. So I, uh, let's hit on that because I've seen you firsthand talk about mentorship uh, you know, a few months back at uh, a Women in Automotive event. And I love how you talk about it. I love why you find it so rewarding and, and why you feel that women especially can benefit from mentorship. So if you could talk a little bit about that and then talk to us more about this beefed up Women in Automotive Mentorship Program and, and what you foresee it to look like uh, in the coming year and beyond. So talk to us a little bit about mentorship because I know you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. And thank you, Veronica, for continuing driving this legacy, this uh, legacy that starts with us telling our story. And I believe that part of the part of mentorship that is so dynamic is that when others get to hear that there have been people that have gone before them that know know and understand what they're going through, it, it brings that connection. So many people um, just want to be heard and understood. And they want to know that they don't walk this pathway alone, this pathway to success. And it's so important that we learn from those that have gone before us, right? And when we want to be heard and understood, we, we need somebody that is neutral, on a neutral ground, right? It's, um, I, I recall from myself when I was young and, and striving to become that person in automotive, I often didn't want to go to my manager. I didn't want to. And then if I went to my family, they had no idea what I was talking about, unless you were talking to my father, who was a previous dealer. <laughs> but he would tell me, just figure it out, right? I needed someone who had a perspective that had gone before me, who could equip me to build my confidence, who would allow me to excel in my workplace and was very neutral. And that's what mentorship does. Mentorship gives each individual two things. One, learning. When we're learning, we want to learn. And it's and, and there's times in, in, in the job, let's just face it, we don't want to ask for help. It, it's embarrassing, or they might think that we just don't know, and or we're not that one to, to go to the next level. So if you can trust someone who's gone before you and learn from their mistakes, you can learn their tricks of the trade, what it took them to become successful, I believe that we will rise in this industry as women in this industry. And you want to do it with someone that you trust and that will understand you. And the second component of mentoring that I, I see it happening, I've been mentoring for several years. Um, the person that's being mentored needs to have that support. They need to know that they have someone in their corner that'll see the, the bigger picture, that can believe in them just a little bit more than they believe in themselves, that it drives them to want to become that person. Uh, they, they, want to hold, they want to be held accountable and they want to know that their mentor can hold the space and the vision for them so they don't feel lost and alone. And, and the accountability component is huge. Uh, I've, I've had sessions with my mentees where there are their breakthrough sessions where they, they were stuck and they just needed someone who they could trust. And, and, and as a mentor, man, that to me, it makes it all worth it. When you start seeing the success that happens, the change that happens. I, I wish I had a mentor when I was young and I did have some mentors. I had male mentors. I didn't have any women mentors. And we are here talking about trailblazing, right? And there are women who, I, I'm one of them, I've been around for 30 years. <laughs> and, and, and I just know that we, the women need to rise up and tell their stories so that those that are coming behind them 
can see what it looks like to be successful. And maybe we can just cut the pain, the challenges down a little so we can rise up the next generation or those that are in line to go to the next, the next phase faster and quicker, right? So I know that women have been making strides in this industry, but it's still male dominated, right? And so we have to face this. We have to face it head on. And so Women in Automotive has created a platform. We have a platform now and it's working, but we are going more robust, bigger and better. <laughs> We're building it bigger and better this year in 2023. We are committing to see we are committed to see that every woman is lifted up and given an opportunity to succeed. This platform that's coming, that's more robust, it will provide a place where women, where everyone can manage, match, motivate, and measure each mentor and mentee experience. It's like match.com for women in automotive. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who wants to level up and thrive in their workplace, this is the platform where you'll be able to track the progress from leadership skills to professional skills, critical thinking, career planning, confidence, decision-making, leadership, emotional intelligence, sales and negotiation skills. And it has to happen from someone who knows this industry. Okay. So audience, thank you so much, Audrey. Fantastic um, input there. Uh, audience, I, I do want to let you know you should have seen Audrey's eyes sparkle a few months back at the last Women in Automotive event that we had when uh, I flat out asked her, why what, why is it so rewarding for you to be a mentor? And uh, she basically said, you know what? In a lot of ways, I get more satisfaction and more pride from the accomplishments of my mentees than I do of my own. And so if you're on the fence about whether to be a mentor or whether to get yourself a mentor, ah, find out more information at womeninautomotive.com. How'd I do? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, next, I want to bring in Joe to this uh, conversation. Now, again, Joe and I, <laughs> we've known each other more years than I care to count. Um, but uh, one of the things I want you to know about J-Dub, as I like to call him, is uh, I actually have, don't make that face at me, I have first-hand knowledge that he has personally helped several women reach greater success in the auto industry. Um, and uh, are you, are you going to cry, Joe? Um, <laughs> That's not I know, <laughs> okay, no, but seriously, um, you know, he, he actually took certain friends of mine aside and he, he gave them encouragement. Uh, he he introduced them to the right people. He gave them that push that they needed so that they could get ahead in their careers. And and that's why I want to talk to you, Joe, because I think this is important. I, I want I want you to tell everyone why you continue to be a fantastic ally to women and how others can do the same. Now I'm sure you've done it for men too, but you basically you know I know for a fact you've done it to a, for at least three women that I personally know. So talk to us about how others in the auto industry can pinpoint a person who really is a rock star and give them a push in the right direction so that they're not wallowing in, in mediocrity someplace and they can really find their stride and, and blaze a trail for their own so that they see greater success in automotive and don't leave this fantastic industry. So when I think, why did I get into allyship? I say it's because I'm selfish. Uh, and I'll explain, you know, I think first and foremost, I have always relished people for their differences, just as much for their similarities. And, and sure, most people prefer to be surrounded by like-minded people. Uh, but everyone knows if you want to achieve success, yes, you need everybody pulling in the same direction, but you also need differences of opinion. And you need those that share a different perspective, in some cases even challenge you. No one continues to improve them, you know, themselves personally, unless they're surrounded, you know, well, no one improves if they're surrounded by yes men. And yes, I use that gender specific nomenclature for a reason. Like I've long felt that women bring as much, uh, like much more fully realized consumer experience to the table than men. Uh, than the average man. And don't get me wrong, I don't think of myself as the average man. I'd like to think of myself as exceptional. But I think most men need to have that women's viewpoint when conducting business. It, it benefits us all 
to get both a man and a woman's perspective, not just man's perspective. So if my own personal goal is to succeed, a woman's opinion doesn't just matter, it's imperative. And every smart person will tell you to surround yourself with different perspectives. And for me, that is what I've done. So I've done it mostly for selfish reasons, I'd like to say, or or maybe I've invested my time in allyship because I was raised by a single mom for a few years in between my father who would only have occasional visits and lived out of state and the man that eventually became my stepfather, uh, rest in peace. You know, for years I saw firsthand how my mom needed support, not just from women, but from, you know, me, a man, or well, at least at that time, a young teenager growing up too quick. Uh, I think because of that life experience, I had this sort of Superman complex, which is where like women, children, underrepresented minority or underserved communities, you know, if they are in help, if I have the personal ability to help them, then I'm going to do it. Uh, and over the years, if you're like me, over the years, you encounter women who have, and they say it, you can see it on their face, you can see it in the actions they take, they have an insatiable drive to succeed, but let's face it, many are stuck in a male-dominated industry or a dealership where uh, their managers or even their co-workers are there to try to keep their thumb on them or disenchant that woman's drive. And yeah, I mean, the, I, the opportunity. It's the opportunity that they're missing, I think. Exactly. I mean, if I feel that just some of my guidance could help buttress their ambition and that my words of encouragement and coaching can propel them on to bigger and brighter things, then it, it isn't a selfless act uh, by any means. Uh, it helps our industry as a whole and selfishly, it solidifies my own legacy as a lot of people, not just a leader of men. So it's the same reason why Dealer Knows is made up of 80% women. Uh, in many cases, when it comes to improving communication with consumers or evaluating communication, you know, why not? Who better than a woman to do that? I mean, they're better listeners. They're naturally more endearing. They're empathetic. Why wouldn't I want my company to espouse those virtues with what we deliver to our clients. So, uh, you know, how men should get involved is just carry on conversations with people who are allies, who are not exactly like you, who might be women who underserved uh, minorities and have those conversations because very often, and they might be a little hesitant to tell you what their goals are, but you can help them achieve it by just lending a listening ear. And if you can, if you have the means, Set aside some time, our mentorship program for WIA and the uh, the software or the portal, if you will, is tremendous. But just from the onset, dedicate some time and say, I'm going to dedicate a little of my time for the selfish act of helping somebody else improve. That's not going to trickle down to me in the success. It's just because it improves the livelihood of others. And that is what sort of makes me drive. But it starts with you as an individual, as an ally to that, uh, you know, that segment of the population to just listen, dedicate some time and find the ability to uh, separate yourself and put yourself in their shoes and help everybody succeed. And that is why he is on the Women in Automotive Advisory Council. Listen to that fervor. I mean, no, Joe, seriously, you're one of those people before I think even, and I, I'm a little bit uh, uh, misty on the dates, but Veronica, back me up here. Didn't you approach Women in Automotive and said, oh, listen, I need to be a part of this organization. <laughs> no, uh, wow. no, I, I, will, I will say, uh, yeah, I mean, our uh, the previous... Uh, leaders or executives of women automotive uh, i will say i'm proud to say i was the first uh, man on the original board of women automotive and i think yeah. it's just because you know, them being women they l would come to me for advice and i would come to them for advice and and i think it is uh all mentorship i don't want to only consider myself as a mentor even if i mentor people uh mentorship's a two-way street there's no way, no way Audrey and I and Adam would do what we do if we didn't also take away and learn something from the people that we were mentoring as well. So we need each other. We really yeah. need each other. And that's where when we stop competing and comparing and it's a male versus a female and we connect and create synergy, that's when change begins to happen.
Agreed. All right. Thank you so much. This is just excellent information today. Okay. Uh, perfect time. Perfect time to finally bring in Adam. Adam. Oh my goodness. Patriot Auto Group. Okay. Your company has won best places to work and automotive news best dealership to work for, for the last, and I want to make sure I got this right, 11 years in a row. Holy moly. And you, you can't win those kind of awards uh, without building a great culture and having really happy employees. So, uh, you know, and as I said at the top of the show, our goal today is to give practical and actionable advice on how dealers can get advance and retain more women in the automotive industry. And so I need to hear it all from you, Adam. I want to know why you do it. How do you recruit? How do you retain? How do you build an outstanding culture that women in, in particular really love? Because I feel like they want something just a little bit. I don't know. Do they need something different? Adam, what is it like over at your dealership? And what can you tell other dealers on how, yes, they can get more women, more diversity into their dealer groups? So, so before we address the the step-by-step -step way to do this, I'm going to say that there's one overwhelming thing that has to be done to be successful as you go forward to maintain a diverse, um, however you define diverse, um, staff that represents um, uh, your community as well as your customer base. And the first word that I would love all of our service managers, general managers, dealers to write down, sales managers, is tolerance. A car dealership is not a high school and it's not a locker room. So when you hear something, you have to stop and make sure that something is said to those individuals that that is not going to be tolerated there. So it's jokes, advances, and exclusion. When people go to have lunch and it's always a bunch of guys, but there are women that work there, if your departments are segregated by gender, and that happens where somebody says, well, I have plenty of women and they all work in the office or I have plenty of women and they're all in the BDC or I have plenty of women. I have women managers there. My controller is a, a woman, right? So it, that means that something's being tolerated in your organization and segregated. So segregation separate, but equal is other than bathrooms is not an acceptable strategy. So tolerance is the first thing that I would say. And then the second thing that I would say in our step-by-step -step is that you have to be intentional. You have to decide that you want a diverse organization and that you want it in the future, not today, but in the future if you don't have it today. So you have to take steps to get there. And so by that, I say um, you have to implement a number of different things that we've done. First thing is, is to take every position in the dealership and define a career path to get to that position. That doesn't mean that everybody that you hire is going to be stepping towards that level. But it has to be defined so that everyone has the opportunity to achieve that if they're the type of person that achieves it. Separate, under my breath, I will tell you, as you prepare people for better positions, higher up positions, they may leave your organization and don't be threatened by that. If you don't have space for them when they're ready, be, be happy that they're going someplace that has the space for them to advance their career. It has to be more about them than the organization and your organization will benefit like a pyramid. It will just continue to grow and to grow and to grow and to grow by doing that. So number one, intentional. Number two, a career path for every position. Number three, this is a recruiting piece that I'll throw out there to our service managers. Go to your tech schools and offer a $250 per semester scholarship for two type of people, and it can be up to 500 if they combine it. $250 to any woman that re that uh, registers and enrolls to become an auto mechanic. You will get pick of the litter because, by the way, you don't want one female tech. You want a lot of female techs. Number two, $250 scholarship to anybody who's a veteran. So these are the two organizations. These are the two types of people that have sometimes greater discipline, sometimes more thought process into where they're going. So those are two things you can do tomorrow. Go reach out to your tech school and offer scholarships to each one of them. By the way, by doing that, you will get the advice of the leaders of that school and you'll get their best candidates. It's happened to us forever. And then bring them in. If you want more women, 
bringing them into entry level positions. Because if you have a career path, you can bring people in an entry level position. So if you come in as a loop tech, which is where all of our women have joined us, um, then they can advance to become a C tech, a B tech, an A tech, and then finally a master tech. If you have quick service, don't hire anybody but women to be the service advisor because that's where your service, future service advisors are going to come from. So this is really kind of simple stuff. And I, for at least for us, it's simple because we do it intentionally. I, wait, I have to stop you right here. Are you, you have a concerted effort to get, bring women in through the service drive. Uh, you have techs, you have female techs. Yes. And, I, and, and, and there are female techs out there. And I will tell you something that um, there is no limitation on a female tech. And there's no limitation on any woman. I'm just curious I, why right. you thought a, a hardened dealer <laughs> thought um, to say, you know, women would be great for this job. Let's go after them. Well, women have achieved in any area of the dealership where you have women, they'll achieve at or near the top. Everybody who has a professional sales woman has her um, multiples in our cases at or near the top in sales, at or near the top in F&I production, at or near the top as a service advisor, at or near the top as a technician, at or near the top um, in the BDC. Every single department where there's women, they're all at or near the top. They're just not willing to be at the bottom. So we all have salespeople and or techs who don't turn a lot of hours or sell a lot of cars. They're not women, right? So, so if you're excluding that, you're only, you're excluding the top, not the bottom. So yes, we do. Absolutely. And so it starts with in all of your recruiting and hiring, anytime if you are running an ad, it says women and men. So we're seeking women and men with the following attributes rather than skill set. So we decided to, to hire based on attributes and help with the skill set. So the tech schools do the, the skill set as, as it relates to turning wrenches, et cetera. But for the most part, we have a program in the store that allows the people to know what their job is to do, have somebody help them do it. And then maybe this is the one thing everybody should write down is that I don't care how many people fill a position. I care that the bay is busy. It is not mandatory as a salesperson to work on a Saturday. So you might be excluding people who don't have babysitters on Saturdays, many of them single women and or married women, by saying everybody works every Saturday here. You can have one off a year, right? So would you stop excluding people or everybody has to close at least three nights a week? No, they don't. So I'm going to take that bay as a piece of real estate because this is a little bit easier. We're open 72 hours a week. Hopefully in the future, we'll be open a little bit more. I don't care how many techs occupy that bay. I care that that bay is busy 72 hours a week. So if I have two people committing to sharing it and producing 140 hours out of that 72, I don't care how they write their schedule. I don't care who's there on Monday. I don't care who's there on Tuesday. I don't care who's there on Saturday. I don't care who opens and I don't care who closes. But the two of them can job share that. And think about that in every position in the dealership as we serve customers, as we serve our community better, of trying to maximize the opportunity through no bravado of working 80 hours a week, no bravado of saying, I make the most money. Everybody should do this because they're going to make more money if they do that. Well, if money is not their measurement of winning, you're appealing to the wrong thing. If somebody says, I want to do this because it allows me to be home, I can do some work and follow up from home. I can come to work at four o'clock in the morning if I'm a tech, as long as I have somebody else there. So you can't be alone in there. If two people can come in and we can work on stuff. Let people tell you what their definition of winning is. Stop telling them what your definition of winning is. In my definition of winning may, may be a lot like Joe's in that you know, we see the world as a better place when people work together from different places, whether it's religion, height, cowboy hat or not. <laughs> uh, it, looks, it looks very fetching on you, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I rarely wear it. So, uh, but, but that being said, women will make your dealership better. That's why you're paying attention to this. And the simple steps are, number one, stop being tolerant of bad behaviors things that are going to get you sued eventually anyway. 
Number two, be very intentional. Number three, scholarships to those. Number four, have a career path that's available to everybody to understand what you have to do to get there. And number five, be flexible. And with that, I remain available to anybody that needs me. Love you. Oh guys. my gosh. And and just so we're clear, because I, I definitely want to make sure we're clear, your dealership model is profitable? Yes or no? Um, the government thinks I pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> okay, good. That's the <laughs> uh, I see Ted has come on, so it looks like we are coming close to time. Uh I would like to go around the horn one last time and, and just ask each of the four of you if you could do, if you could give one piece of advice, something that somebody can do today to get started, to be a better ally to women, to either mentor or just to, to help more women in the automotive industry, what would that one thing be very quickly? Veronica? Visit our website, womeninautomotive.com. <laughs> Audrey? If we know that women are the ones buying all the cars, let's not let's just equip these women in automotive to be the face of what people see. Let's rise them up. It's you're going to be selfish like Joe and Adam, and you'll win. Come on, at a girl. All right, J Dub, Joe. <laughs> I'd say introduce yourself, extend a handshake, and and listen. And when you have the opportunity. Uh, urge your uh, dealership executive management to uh, allow you to attend, unless you already are executive management, attend the Women Automotive Conferences and events. Thank you so much. Adam, we'll close with you, sir. So I'm going to start with the word stop. Stop being tolerant of things that you wouldn't want your daughter to face and stop trying to fit everybody in the same box. There's lots of ways that we can succeed by bringing other people into this business and by growing our people, and don't worry if they leave you. Wow. Panel, wow. thank you so Powerful. much for being Powerful. here today. What a great conversation. Powerful. Ted? Eliana, I got a full disclosure. Uh, my daughter, who just graduated college uh, in May, is now a woman in automotive, Veronica. Uh, she's working in the automotive uh, uh, career, and uh, she is a customer, full disclosure, of Patriot Automotive Group of Adam oh. Aaron's. Uh, with her new uh, Subaru. So she loves it, Adam. And uh, thank you all for what you do. I took a lot of spectacular notes, Adam. I was just jotting that all down there at the end. So I want to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, Audrey McKinley, great to see you again, my friend. It's been a long time since the last Fix Stops Roundtable. So we got to have you back more often. Joe Webb, thank you so much. Uh, Adam Ahrens, thank you. Thank you so much. Veronica, congratulations. Great work. Women in Automotive. I'm looking forward to what's going to happen now in 2023. Great things. And, uh, you know, Eliana, once again, my friend from New Jersey, uh, you lit it up. So uh, thank you so much for all you do for our industry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having our panel. We will be back. And as Joe said, stay selfish, everyone. Stay selfish. <laughs> Ted, thank you so much for inviting us. And we look forward to having another Women in Automotive panel, hopefully very soon in the future again at the Fix Fixed Ops Roundtable discussion. Everybody, great thanks. The Women in Automotive panel here today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.